Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Bridget, and I'm in Al-Anon. Um, that just made my day because I turned 30 this year, and I had a baby about two years ago, so that that was good. So you're, you're not going to get in trouble for that. Um, I would like to say that I'm, you know, real grateful to be here and be doing this, but that would be a lie. So um, <laughs> this is the last thing I ever thought that I would do, ever, okay? I waited to take speech until the last semester of my college career. I, my worst nightmare is to be the center of attention, you know, but having said all that, that shows the gratitude that I have for the program and for what it did for me. And um, uh, for the first couple years that I was in, I guess, recovery, sort of, um, I got by by listening to speaker CDs. And so this is just my way of, I guess, giving back to that. But um First thing, a disclaimer kind of I want to say is this is my story, uh, contrary to what y'all might think, that this isn't, a lot of y'all know my alcoholic, his name is Lee, and he's around here, and most people know him, but, um, and I will talk about him just because um, he's part of my story, and he's the reason that I walked through the doors, um, he's not why I stayed, but he's the reason that I got there, and so, um it's the other side of his of his story, I guess you could say, but it is my story. And um, so there may be some things in there that, you know, it sounds like maybe I'm talking about bad about him, but you have to remember this was before. And <laughs> I, I adore him now and, um, you know, but uh, the, this this what it was like. But um, anyways. Okay. I think that's it. If I start crying, I can't stop, and it's just like a, it's bad. So I try, I try not to, not because I'm embarrassed about it, but it's just because I, once I start, it's just done, you know. So, um, let me see what it was like. Okay, I was born here, probably, you know, five miles from here. I was born at ECM Hospital. Uh, my parents were, I mean, nobody has perfect parents, right? But, you know, they're pretty close, I guess you could say. Um, I had a great childhood. Um, I had a, have a brother who's um, uh, annoyingly well-adjusted to life and to his surroundings and was, like, class favorite and everything, you know, just, like, Come on, you know, and <laughs> but um, so I don't really have anybody to blame for why for my problems or why I'm here or or whatever, but um so the first thing that happened to me that was pretty significant around five years old, um I was sexually abused by somebody that I trusted, and um i i say that because I think from the, at that point I learned to repress things and I learned to um, uh, for some reason when a lot of times when people are abused they react the opposite way and I think I, I from then on I sought male attention and because I thought that's what that was I was good for I guess you could say or that was um, I don't know I, that's just how I did it but um that's what happened to me, but I'll talk more about that later in the fourth and fifth step. But, um, and then later on in the fifth grade, oh, well, I got to tell the third grade story first. Um, third grade, we all went to Bear Creek, my school. You know where Bear Creek is if you're around here, you know, whatever. And um, we were going on the ropes course 
which to me, I promise, it felt like it was like three stories high. I mean, it was so high. And everybody in the class did it except for me. I would not do it. And it's probably like that high now. If I went back now, it would probably be ridiculous, but I would not do it. And I was the only one um, that wouldn't do it because I was already had a lot of fear. I was just scared. And another thing is I didn't want to look bad in front of them because I didn't want to get up there and mess up in front of everybody else. And um, I've still got to go back and do that. I keep saying I'm going to do it, but I'm, it would it would probably be hilarious because I'm sure it's like you know three feet high, and I would probably wouldn't even. But I'm going to go do it one day. But um, anyway, that's when you know I sort of I knew that I had I was different. It just seemed like I I had more fear and I had more. Um, I don't know. I think another reason I didn't want to do it is because I didn't have control over it. You know, I was kind of out of control in front of other people. But um, anyways, and then in fifth grade is the chicken story, the infamous chicken story. We hatched um, chickens in our fifth grade class. You know, in incubators, you do that and everything. Whatever. And I came home with two chickens. I had one, you know, that was just normal little chicken. And then I had one that I don't know, it was like maimed or like it was probably going to die. It was the runt and it could barely move and it was like all this extra care you had to do to take care of it. And my mom was like, why did you bring this one home? And I said, because nobody else wanted it. And she was like, well, there's a reason nobody else wanted it. And I was like, but, you know, that, and that's how I was. I took in the animals and I took care of them and, I, you know, no matter what it cost. And, I, and that's not a bad thing. But for for me, some of my best qualities also turn into my worst qualities. It's really weird. It's when I when I hit that, there's like a balance. But when I when I go too far one way, it's my fault. It's like a fault that I have. But um, so that was just kind of like I'm just setting the stage here for, you know, what's what is to come. But um, anyway, everything very normal. I was you know sports whatever. Um, Pretty much, I went to a Christian school. I was raised in church. I had a warped perception of God. I'm not blaming that on anybody at all. I just did for some reason. And um, um, when I met my alcoholic, I was about 16. Well, I say I met him, but um, I knew him previously. But um, we really met sort of when I was 16 years old and... uh, from then on, he was my higher power for about 10 years, I think. I hate saying that, but um, it, <laughs> it's just the truth. I mean, I don't know how else to say it, but um, so we met, and, you know, we were kind of back and forth kind of thing. He was older, he's older than me. He's like three years older than me, um, and he wasn't very far along in his disease. He was at the normal what some people do and then they stop, you know, um, I had no idea, you know, any of this was, was about to unfold, but anyway, um, he's a preacher's son and my dad was a, uh, song leader, music minister, whatever you want to call that. So, I mean, you know, it's just perfect. You know, we both went to the Christian school. I mean, it is just like, you know, it's just gonna, not going to end well. Like there's no way this is going to be good. And, um, so, uh, Okay, I'm going to have to talk about my dad. And, uh, okay. So I was about, we were dating. We had broken up 500 times and gotten back together. I mean, it was just a typical, I mean, you know, y'all know what I'm saying. You know, just, and um, so we had gotten back together. I was about 19, 20. I, I honestly don't remember. And um, my dad got sick. He was 52, I think. No, he was 51 when he got sick. And um, I was a daddy's girl. I mean, big time. And uh, it was, I'm sure a lot of y'all have experienced that, you know, a parent getting sick. But it got me, you know. Anyway, so... This was August, and Lee proposed to me like two months later, so of course what do I say? 
I think this is 2001, I'm not sure. <coughs> or two, 2002 maybe. So, you know, everything in my head was saying no. Don't, you're supposed to say no, but um, I couldn't handle, if I say no, then what? You know, um, I couldn't handle any more pain at that time. <laughs> So I said yes anyway. And my dad um this got worse and worse and um I was really preoccupied with taking care of him because I lived at home at the time. And I think Lee at that time was, was using and stuff and it was progressively getting worse, but I was so focused on other things that I didn't I couldn't really see. You know, we were talking about denial in our meeting and I was in denial later, but at this time I was just ignorant, you know, I just had no idea. I had no idea. And anyway, he got sicker and sicker and he lived for about six months and he died in February and I got married in October. But I will say this, um, when he was in the hospital, Lee was there, you know, even even in the state he was in, you know, because he's always been a good person. But um, anyway, okay, I've got to move on from that. I told you I can't stop when I start. Okay, so he died in February, and I was living at home with my mother, and I got married in October. So, that is when it got really bad. Because, you know, you can be with somebody and you can be dating or engaged. Because we didn't live together before. So, um, until you live with somebody, I mean, because he could, he could hide a lot of stuff, you know. But um, at that point... Um, I think I had made myself numb, you know, I think, and I, and I wasn't, I guess, I don't know, a lot of people say they were angry at God, you know, when they have loss and stuff, I, I think I, I wasn't anything, I think I was just numb, I think I was just, I couldn't handle any more pain or grief, and so I just shut it all down, you know, I'm just gonna not feel anything, but, um, so we got married, and uh, it really, it really wasn't that bad when we got married. Like it, w it hadn't progressed yet. He progressed really, really fast, and so did I in in return. But um, uh, he and he's an alcoholic. Okay, he is an alcoholic, but he he's a lot of drugs, and drugs got him to his bottom really fast because we were poor, and so. <laughs> He had to steal, so that's what. <laughs> so that's what. Um, you know, it just he had uh, he was work. I was in school. I was in social work school. Um, of course, I was. <laughs> how many how many Al-Anon people are in here? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you are social workers, teachers, or nurses? Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Or therapist, yeah. It's ridiculous. Um, anyways, so I was in school, and he was working for a family friend of mine. And uh, <clears throat> this is what our life was like. Um, we watched a lot of TV. We didn't go anywhere. Um, I made excuses for him all the time of why he was missing events. I chose to make excuses for him. He didn't ask me to. So that's not him. It's on me. Um, <clears throat> I remember he missed Thanksgiving one time because he had this stomach virus for the third time <laughs> that month, I think. I'm not kidding. I mean, it was always something. But um, but I'll say this. Um, his His using and drinking was kept very secretive for me, and I didn't know. I thought 100% that I had married a jerk, and that was just what it was. I had no idea. I had no idea. Um, 
It, all, it made so much sense once I, you know, finally knew. But um, um, his addiction got really bad really fast. Like I said, when we first got married, about a year later, um, we were just, it wasn't necessarily that we fought, but we didn't do anything. It was just like a, I can't even, I guess you understand what I'm saying. It was just like an empty, gross, like, just walking dead people, you know, like no, no fun, no laughter, no, no nothing. And just, you know, it's like I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what I, you know, I just thought, well, yeah, I really thought it was all his fault, really, honestly. But, um, anyway, so moving on, we, um, started, uh, I started noticing money was missing and, um, Shockingly, but um, it took me like three years in Al-Anon to be able to look at my bank statement online without my heart starting to pound, like before I looked at it. I'm not kidding. It was like a big deal because every time I looked, it would be like $1,000 in the hole or something. But um, Anyway, so this is another running joke in our house because Lee always said every week he said, because I was in charge of paying the bills, but I didn't make any of the money. I think I was like, a, I think I babysat or something. I don't remember. It's such a blur to me. It's just as much a blur to me as it is to him, I promise. Um, he would say, I'm going to bring you my check this week, I promise. I promise I'm going to bring you my check, and we'll pay all this. I have never, to this day, I never saw one single check for like two years. Never. I don't know what they look like. Like that's and every week he would say that and I would be like, oh, he's gonna bring it to me this week. I know it, he means it, he's gonna bring it to me and then we're gonna it's gonna be fine. Well, um he started getting um <laughs> he spoke this morning and he was saying he had loans, um, but they called embezzlement. Uh he was <laughs> he was borrowing paychecks from his um in advance from his boss and uh Okay, remember, I have no idea that he's ever even uh, done a drug other than smoke some pot. No clue, okay? This is like how secretive he was, and I guess how ignorant I was, and in denial, I guess, but I don't know which, it's hard to decide which one it was. But um, I had planned a trip um, with my best friend to go to New York, which... Right there should tell you, why would you go to New York with your best friend and not your husband? But you know why. <laughs> um, so I was getting ready to leave, and um, I went to her apartment to pick her up, and we were sitting there. So I guess at this time I was 22 or 3, I don't, I don't know. And the phone rings, and it's my brother, which is odd. And he said, I, you know, I need to talk to my sister and... I I got on the phone and he said I talked to so and so my husband's boss they were friends and he said um, uh, Lee lost his job last night <clears throat> and I was like really and because I mean I'd seen him that morning and he got up and went went to work that morning <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said yeah he's he's stolen um a lot of money from him and he found out and he fired him and you know all this kind of stuff and i was like i literally remember uh being on the floor literally like it's one of those times where you're up face down on the floor like what am i supposed to do what's wrong you know and long story short we my brother and i uh, and another family friend um confronted him um and his sister um and asked him to take a drug test i think i skipped something about him saying it about it was about drugs oh he said that he used to do drugs but he wasn't doing them you know some some kind of crazy thing and um that i'm sure i believed at the time but um and so my sister-in-law her name's Laura and uh, she handed him a drug test, which you can buy him at the pharmacy. I never knew that. 
you can just go buy a drug test. I was like, I would have done that a long time ago. You know, you can't you can't prove it because I could never prove anything. It was like I sort of suspected it sometimes, but I couldn't prove anything. Anyway, so she tried she handed him the drug test and he knocked it out of her hand, which is like was crazy for him because he's not he's a very gentle creature. You know, he doesn't he's not that way. And he knocked it out of her hand and was just defiant, you know, y'all are, I can't believe y'all, you know, he's loaded the whole time, which is just classic, but, um, anyway, he finally, I don't know how he convinced him or whatever, but, um, he finally came clean about that much of the truth, which I, I truly believe it was all he was capable of telling me at that time, and, um, so I was like, okay, whatever, you know, um, we'll do whatever, and we, I don't even know how we got in contact with um, a treatment center at Discovery Place, called Discovery Place, it's in Nashville, and um, we, well, actually we went to New Life first, that's the place, that's what it's called, and, well, no, we didn't, we went to Detox first, so me, here we go, me and my father-in-law, the preacher, big South African missionary preacher man, driving the car and his sister's in the front seat and we're in the back seat and Lee is um completely dope sick. I mean, I hadn't I didn't know at the time he was, but looking back, I mean he was like sick, sick, sick. I just thought he was upset, you know, or what or embarrassed, you know, and he's like, I was upset. But um so we're we're driving along and they're like, Oh look at the beautiful trees. You know, like they had I'm not kidding they said that. They were like, look at the trees, how pretty they are and we're i I'm like I'm about I think I cussed in front of him, which is hilarious, because I don't typically just cuss, and I was so irritated that I did, and he just laughed. But um, anyway, so we got to detox, and I'm, I go back um, to the room with him to get him admitted to the hospital, and um, that's when I it sort of hit me the the what was really going on because the doctor came in and said, I need to know what you're using or whatever, or what you're on. And he told him, and I was like, I did never even like heard of some of the stuff he said, you know, I was like, who are you? What is, you know? And then they looked at me that like, I'm sitting there like, I probably, I weighed like 108 pounds at that time. I mean, I was like 15 pounds less than I am now. And he was like, and that's completely sober. I mean, I'm not on any kind of dope or anything, okay? And um, and he, they looked at me and was like, what are you on or whatever? I was like, I don't do drugs. And they're like, you smoke or drink? No, I don't smoke. And they're like, they totally didn't believe me. Like, I think I'm a, I don't remember if they wanted me to do a drug screen or not. But anyway, I was like, I promise. I don't know. It's whatever. So anyway, he was in there for... A few days, seven days, I think. And I bought buddy I called every day, you know, just like seeing how he's doing, what's he doing now. Oh gosh, that's just like crazy. And uh just you know, and then we went and picked him up and took him to uh a treatment center that was co ed and I was like, uh no, this ain't happening <laughs> And so we left that place and um <laughs> And which I'm glad we did because where he ended up was where he was supposed to be. But um, he went to a place called Discovery Place and um, left him there. And I met a man named Jack, and he was the first person in recovery that I ever met. Um, and I will love him forever because he helped me tremendously. Um, and he took me on a tour of the place, and it was up to my standards, you know. The I was like, what is what do they eat? Make sure they, you know, God forbid he'd go hungry for a meal. And um, I'll, I'll never forget, and Bob and I were talking about this um, yesterday. We were on the tour, and, and Jack said, um, was trying to explain alcoholism to me. Because this is literally, I mean, I'd heard of AA, and I've heard of alcoholism, and I've heard, but that's like, like foreign language to me, you know, I just didn't, that doesn't happen to me, you know, or that doesn't happen to, to normal good people, right? I mean, and, um, and I always wanted to say, I, I couldn't understand why you couldn't just stop, you know, that's, that's the number one thing I hear in the Al-Anon meeting is, 
why can't they just stop or what what is the you know that was like the big question and and Jack said um it's like being in a cave that's completely dark and you can't see your hand in front of your face you know it's that dark and you're calling and you're calling and you want to get out of it but you can't see you can't see where to go it's like you're just you're just grabbing into the, the darkness and so somebody else that's been in that cave and knows how to get down there and how to get back up has to come down there and hold you by the hand and guide you out. That's the only way out. And I was telling them yesterday, I, I, I was giving, given a gift of clarity. I was, God was doing for me what I couldn't do for myself because I got it. I understood. And I was like, okay, so I can't do it. It, I, I have no power to do it because I haven't been down there. So, um, I'm going to let you do it. And, um, I let go of him at that time. And no, I mean, I still called every day. And I, still, <laughs> but, um, I tried, you know, I, I think I was, I was, you know, you don't change overnight, but, um, I was, that was when it was, that first thing was planted in me, like, okay, I can do this. I, I I can let go of this, and and as soon as he stops, when he gets sober, it's going to be fine, right? Okay. So um, then I go to uh, family day or family week. I don't remember, which I like to call hell week or hell day, however you want to call it. And um, I'm sitting in there, and they're like, this stuff on the wall about the steps and, you know, and... I was like, this is the craziest. Like, why are they talking to me about this? I, you know, I'm like the saint here. I am like for staying with him and doing all this, you know. And I started then kind of, that's when my denial started for me. Um, was I, I didn't think that I had a problem. I, you know, I thought the problem was him and, as long as he didn't drink, he'd be fine, and um, which was totally not true. So I, um, he got home from treatment, and it was uh, not as bad as as using days, but um, you know, it's like two strangers. I mean, like who is this person? And um, he was in meetings. Literally, he would leave at like 5.30 and come home at 9.30 because that's the only way he knew to be. And that, you know, and I think I I sort of understood that at the time, but over time I got resentful about it. And uh, I'm not going to share a lot of stuff just for the sake of, I mean, I believe secrets keep you sick, but I also think you have privacy in a lot of, in your marriage and and stuff like that. But I sought out attention from others and um, because... My alcoholic was well, and I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to interact with somebody that's well. So, um, because I'm sick, you know, at that point. And um, that kind of brought me to a bottom, I think, uh, starting to. I started going to some Al-Anon. I asked somebody to be my sponsor, and they said, we don't do sponsorship here. Which, I'm not saying, not talking bad about anybody, it's just what they told me. So, um, I was like, alright, well, okay. And, um, I asked somebody else, and she said no. And so, I was kinda like, that's no excuse, but I'm just saying it wasn't, it's a little different than going to AA around here, you know? <laughs> You're kinda, it, there was only like two groups at the time, I think, and one has since folded. And, um, anyway. So, I'd listened to CDs and I read and reading was the most important thing I ever did in the beginning. It was, was, um, I read the big book. I read to the wives, the family afterwards, all that. But then I started reading, reading Al-Anon literature, um, that started changing me, started listening to speaker CDs, AA and Al-Anon and started seeing, could see then when I heard other people talk, I could identify and say, Oh yeah. Okay. That's where, yeah, I'm al I don't know why. I, it's nobody's fault um, that I am the way I am. It's not my parents' fault. It's not my church's fault. It's not, you know, I just am. I just belong. Um, but um, 
Anyway, so I had some health problems. This is about, Lee had been sober about two years, I think. And um, I had, long story short, I was, I thought that I had leukemia. And I had to go see um, the oncologist that was my dad's doctor. And that sent me into a complete tailspin. I mean, like, you know, fear just crazy. And uh, it turned out after several tests and all that kind of stuff that that I didn't, but, which is great. But um, I still, I think that kind of tipped me over the edge. I think I had a lot of repressed stuff from my dad. Um, from I don't think I ever grieved because I didn't want to feel it. And, like, someone was talking, I guess, this morning about unresolved grief, what it can do to somebody. It did it to me. And um, I started having physical manifestations, I think, of untreated Al-Anon. Like, I started having panic attacks. I'm not talking about, like, I'm going to freak out. I'm talking, like, I convinced the doctor I was having a stroke, and he put me in the hospital to run, run tests on my heart. Because I was like, I'm di- I am, I am dying. I am having a stroke and I can't function. Like that kind of panic attack I'm talking about. Just fear, paralyzed by fear. Seriously. And um, and I'm a mental health professional, by the way. During all this. <laughs> but um, anyway, so I got to a bottom, to my bottom. I was on the couch in the fetal position and couldn't function for like two or three days. Could barely eat. Um, And I think, well, I know it's because for several years I had prayed for willingness, but I never had it. Like I, I, I wanted to, to be in recovery and I wanted to do the stuff, but I wasn't willing to do it. I hadn't hurt enough, I don't think. And so God did that for me, which I'm grateful for. But um, that's how he gets my attention. He gets my attention when I have to do stuff like this because I talked to him. I had conscious contact with him more this week than I have in six months. I'm not kidding. Um, He knows how to get me, you know. And so um, actually my husband 12-stepped me. And uh, I believe he called Bob O is here, who's the second person I met in recovery. He's one of the guys that I called every day at Discovery Place and asked what Lee was eating for lunch, and if he was just clothes were clean, you know, stupid, come on, you know, it's so embarrassing. Um, because he was still my higher power at that time, you know. I didn't. Um, anyway, so I think Lee called Bobo because we had we had gotten made formed relationships with a lot of people there, and um, he gave me gave Lee a cell phone number, and Lee said, "Are you willing to do anything to um to get better?" And I said, "Yes," and I meant it. I uh, I would have cut off my big toe if they would have asked me to, because I couldn't live like that. I wasn't living, and um, that's a gift, man. That gift of desperation is like, because I couldn't start until I until I'm desperate, and I, I I won't change until I am desperate, and I have nowhere else to go. That's just how I am. Y'all may can relate. I don't know, but um, anyway, so he gave me a phone number. I called this lady I'd never met in my entire life um, and immediately was like, I'd known her my whole life. It was just such a God thing. Her name's Sissy, and she is she lives in Nashville. And um, we started working the steps. I didn't want to take medicine, like, for anxiety. I'm not talking about, like, benzos. I'm talking about, like, no fun medicine, like <laughs> antidepressants. Yeah. And um, I didn't want to because I thought that made me weak, and I thought that I just didn't have enough faith. And she told me to get over it. (laughs) And she said, uh, who do you think created modern medicine? And if you think it, if it's going to help you to get on your feet, then why wouldn't you do it, you know? And um, so I did. And we started working the steps. I drove to Nashville. We met in Columbia. I... Um, like I said, I was willing. I've done whatever. Um, but her and her husband are two of the greatest blessings out of the whole ordeal to me and, and the people that I met in recovery. But um, we did a lot of work. We uh, I, I worked a lot on the grief stuff 
I did a lot of that um, that I had not resolved. And um, uh, sometime during that, it was after my fourth and fifth step, I think. You know, I did I did all that, the whole deal, and I um, forgave a lot of people. Most importantly, I had to forgive myself. I don't know about AA because I can't speak for y'all, but I know a lot of Al-Anons um, have the hardest person to forgive is yourself. And um, because... I held myself to a higher standard, I think, than I had unrealistic expectations of, of others and myself. And um, I had to do that. Um, I, the person that abused me, I don't I don't have any feeling toward at all. I mean, I'm not, I just don't think, it, it doesn't have an, an effect on me anymore. And um, uh, I'm trying to think of some amends, to, oh, an amends story. Um, sometimes Al-Anons have a different kind of experience with amends, you know, because I didn't necessarily steal from people, but, you know, I did lie to people, and um, I did cover, and I did, um, I mean, of course, there's the childhood stuff and, you know, all that kind of stuff, but as far as the now kind of thing, something that really blessed me and that I do with um, sponsees is, um, for instance, my mother remarried about a year after my dad died, and I was... I love, he's a great guy. This is just goes to show, he takes care of my mother. He's always treated me like his own daughter. He's a great man. But, you know, I just have resentment for him because, why? Well, he's not my dad. So that's not rational, but I did. And so how I made amends to him is, you know, I didn't say, hey, I don't, I resent you because you're not my dad. I, my sponsor told me to um, start writing him, like, cards and letters that said, I appreciate you and what you do for my mother, and how you, you know, the reasons why he's a blessing to me. And it completely changed our relationship. I mean, I love him now, and he treats my son like his own, you know. <laughs> and not that we had a bad relationship. I did that with my mother, too, and um, lots of people in my life. And um, uh, anyway, so it got a lot, life got a lot better, and um, I got pregnant uh, yeah, during that time. I mean, I think I was still working with Sissy um, on the actual steps, maybe. We may have already finished, but, um, and I had a miscarriage. And I, once again, I thought that didn't really affect me, you know, kind of like the whole thing with my dad again. I'm like, well, it's not a big deal, you know, it happens to everybody. But um, it did, and we we did a lot of work on that. Um, so that's something that the program gave me that you know I, I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, uh, I wrote a letter to my child, and and I read it, and um, I read it to my sponsor. I went drove to Nashville, and we talked about it and cried and read it and all that. And that very day, um, I got pregnant with my son, and. Um, uh, he's two years old now. He was here last night. I think y'all saw the little maniac running around. But um, okay. So then I get pregnant, and I'm so sick, so sick. And um, we had just started our group. Literally, I told them I was pregnant on the first meeting. That was when I had the miscarriage, though. But so then, like a couple months later, we had just um. Oh, I didn't talk about Lisa. Okay, during that time, um, <laughs> during this time, um, this lady came into my life. Her name's Lisa, and she's here. And we were both like, well, I'll say God sent her into my life is what I'll say. <laughs> they, God put us on each other's paths. And we were both searching for something um, because I had a sponsor, and I had a program in the steps, but I didn't have a fellowship. Um, because there was a, a group that met here, but it was during the day, and I worked, and so I couldn't go during the day. And I couldn't make it to where I could go during the day. It was one of those deals. So um, after a couple years, um, Lisa and I were like, we got to I mean, it was just ridiculous. Like, oh, we got to start a group. And um, so we got together with some core members, and we started um, our pastor recovery group. I think there's three of me and Tina and Lisa and two other ladies um, that never came back. But um, anyway, we trucked along for about a year and chaired all the meetings, whether there was one or two or 
you know, seven or whatever. And, um, I had a baby during that time and I went berserk again because, um, I don't know if anybody's ever had a baby, <laughs> but, uh, I really had really bad postpartum depression, really bad. And once again, I didn't want to get on medicine. And once again, my sponsor said, get over it. And, um, uh, so I did and it got better and I, and I promise if I hadn't been an Al-Anon, I would have never done that. I would have never asked for help. I would have never, um, said I can't do this. Uh, you know, uh, something's got to give, but I did. And, um, I have, you know, Tina and Lisa are my, I heart them. I heart Tina and Lisa. Um, but, uh, <laughs> But, um, cause they were there for me through all that. And, uh, anyway, our group has started to grow and, uh, it's really awesome what God has done. And, um, we have meetings on Thursday nights and Saturday mornings and, uh, it's really awesome. And I'll tell you what it's like now. Um, now what Al-Anon has given me is, Gratitude that I got to, um, hold my dad's hand when he was sick and that I can appreciate being a mother instead of, um, complaining about it, which I do sometimes. But, um, I can, I live, I try to live in the moment with my son and I try to parent him with spiritual principles and, um, when I act like a jerk to my husband or to somebody else, um, I try to make amends for it. And um, I try to give, I try to be a vessel of God and to um, show kindness and love to other people, no matter what. And I'm not so hard on myself. And I have to say what, AA has given me, because I have to talk about that because, you know, I love AA and that's how I, I listened to it and was it in AA before, really before I was Alan on sort of, I just didn't really qualify, but I was there. Um, you know, you gave me a husband, a, a partner to parent with, not just another child, you know, cause, um, he took care of me when I was sick, when I was pregnant. He would have never done that. Um, and I let him take care of me, which is what Al-Anon gave me. And uh, he makes amends to me when he's a jerk. And and I'm okay with him being a jerk sometimes because people are jerks sometimes. But um, we go to our meetings. Um, we we work with new people, with couples, with um, new people in Al-Anon, NAA, and um, something that I always try to remember, that just because Bob's sitting right there, it made me think about it. Um, whenever I talk to new people on the phone or whatever, I'm telling y'all, you think an alcoholic coming in is bad? Uh-uh. Wait till you work with a family member. Uh, I mean, that, talk about like beating your head against the wall. But every time I talk to somebody new and I start feeling that like where I want to shake them, I think about Bob O and I think about how kind and patient he was with me when I called him every day and asked these stupid questions and he was just patient and, um, and didn't make me feel stupid, you know, <laughs> and, uh, that's what the program gave me. And um, so now today we have a son and we live a normal, normal life, I guess you could say. One of the biggest things, and I say this all the time, and earthlings, which is what I call people who aren't in the program, probably don't understand this, but we can go to the mall or Target and like walk around and like buy something or like, we can go out to eat, and it's not like a big deal. I mean, that makes sense to you, hopefully. You get what I'm trying to say. Like, we can do, like, normal people stuff. 
Like sometimes we'll be like driving down the road and we'll be like going to like a barbecue. I don't know. I've never been to a barbecue, but like it sounded good. But it's like you're going to something completely like a normal person and we're like, are we really doing this? Like we're like normal people. Or we like go to church and be like, we're sitting in church. Like, oh my gosh, you know. <laughs> but um, anyway, God has really done more, way more with my life than I could have ever dreamt or imagined or or anything and um that is a direct result of a willingness and um taking direction from somebody else and um trying to stay in my own hula hoop and two things that I learned how to say in Al Anon that have changed my life are um I only say three things. The first one is um that's none of my business. Um, that sounds like a personal problem to me. And have you talked to Morris lately? Or have you talked to your sponsor lately? <laughs> and those are, those are life changing if you're an Al Anon. So, um, I've learned how to, to work on, on my program and myself. And uh, it's changed me tremendously. Um, I'm going to close with a reading that we read at every single one of our Al Anon meetings. Um, and if there was one reading that I would want somebody to hear, this is it, and that's why we read it at our meetings. Why is it so hard to admit we are powerless over alcohol, as the first step suggests we do? All of us have heard and shared in discussions at Al-Anon meetings as to whether this should be interpreted as alcohol or the alcoholic. We have no power over either one. No one can control the insidious effect of alcohol or its power to destroy the graces and decencies of life. No one can control the alcoholic's compulsion to drink, but we do have a power derived from God, and that is the power to change our own lives. Acceptance does not mean submission to a degrading situation. It means accepting the fact of a situation and then deciding what we will do about it. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.